Let me tell you a story about Destiny that you may or may not be familiar with. One of identity and development. 2014 was a different time in gaming and Destiny had shifted from so many different paths like a full story game, a full on MMORPG, even a fantasy adventure with this giant toad. Trailers would tell you a different story than the one we would receive. In the words of Kotaku's Jason Schreier, in the summer of 2013, months before they were supposed to ship their next video game, the game developers at Bungie went into panic mode. A year before Destiny's launch, senior staff at Bungie didn't want a linear story. They wanted it open and loose. Yet another change to what Destiny was supposed to be. At the time, this was nothing short of a bad call to everyone, and it's the reason they would not only scrap their lead writer Joseph Staten's story, but it would also explain why the game was a small piece of meeting each faction instead of a large picture of what was to come. Fans of what Destiny was shaping up to be were disappointed after rumors of a story rescuing the Exo Rasputin through planets and moons, finally concluding on an odd ship orbiting Saturn called the Dreadnought, was simply not going to be a reality anymore. That blue alien in the slums of Earth was gone too. Now he is a brother of the blue alien queen. This year was confusing and a muddied story, but with some saving graces in the leveling system for me, exotics, PvP, the overall feel of the game, but most of all, the raid content. We have spoken about the Vaults of Glass and Crota's End, but now I want to focus on what was supposed to be the end of the original vision, the Dreadnought. The place where in the original version, we were to rescue Rasputin from the Hive, lifting him up and out of the grips of our enemy but this time in a whole new direction, a more focused direction, and a whole year after Destiny's release, this was to be where a king was to fall. Some footage in this video is from players around the community. Their links will be in the description of this video, as well as the music too. This expansion, The Taken King, introduced strikes, crucible maps, exotics, a revamped leveling system, a coherent story which sees us fighting a new Taken War, this time on the Hive God, Oryx, and his Dreadnought. We have covered the story of the Taken King in a previous video, but here is the short version. Oryx gets mad because we killed his son Crota. Oryx goes boom to the Awoken. Oryx takes over Phobos, turns enemies into Taken. We steal Cade's stealth drives to say hi to Master Chief, it's like all things. You gotta know where to look. Enter frequency 5982, Ghost. Pod number 10201. A guardian with exceptional light sealed himself inside. He's been in there for centuries. Before I found you, I tried to resurrect him, but he preferred to sleep. He said the last war was enough for a thousand lifetimes. We go to the portal, but aren't ascended. We fight Cabal who got sucked into this. We sneak into Crota's grave. We fight Oryx. Oryx does not die. Instead, Oryx absorbs the Taken Essence and clearly was even stronger than before. I mean, he laughs at us and teleports away. Of course, this led to us getting the swords, the black hammer, the no time to explain, as well as a slew of other exotic quest weapons and plenty of legendaries that would become staples like the Hung Jury, Treads Upon Stars, a year two Imago Loop, and wait. The raid came out September 18th, 2015. That is only three days after the DLC's launch. And if you were a player back then, then you'd also know that this DLC marked the first time Bungie engaged in weapon retirement, wiping the Gallahorn and lots of other exotics as well as legendaries from even being allowed to level in year two. 
Not to mention, infusion was a calculated process and would infuse between your weapons level and a higher weapons level. So if you had a 270 light weapon and a 280 light weapon, the light level after infusion would be somewhere around 275. Infusion calculators would be your only real friend here. So a whole DLC, new leveling, weapon and armor retirement, and a new enemy in three days to fight. Nobody had time to get any exotic quests, the secret exotics weren't out yet, and the sandbox had completely changed from year one sandbox. With all that being said, let me introduce you to the raid that changed Destiny forever. King's Fall. You cannot face this alone. Six of you must rise and stand together as the king falls. The day is September 18th, 2015, at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and the raid begins with many teams excited to jump in as this was to be the pinnacle for the reawakening of Destiny content. Rumors started circulating on how large this raid was going to be, with Bungie even releasing a trailer to encapsulate the sheer size of it. This raid would deliver in almost every way possible, and I want to try to do my best to put you back in that space and give you a feel for the team's racing and get familiar with some names. Math Class, The Rare Drop Crew, The Legend Himself Clan, Team Invigorate, and more. Redeem had not fully been established yet in this race, so their time was really yet to come here. But with that being said, these were your main competitors on day one, and at 10 a.m. this raid was to be dropped with most teams prepped actually going in at a proper level. You see, the raid was launched at light level 290, but most teams ready to rock this were around light 290 to 297. This was because they grinded hard in the days to come, whether it was through a new system of legendary marks for legendary items from vendors, or if it was just through farming strikes and legendary drops naturally happening. All of these teams were loaded and ready to go, but like I said, new metas of weapons changed from year one, so no Galahorn was allowed. But new supers were in play like Tether, which was the first real debuff in Destiny to my knowledge, and Sunbreaker Titan with the ability to use Melting Point for a huge buff to stack damage. These abilities would become key in the game and are still staples today. With all of that out of the way, I want to officially introduce you to the world's first race for King's Fall, the raid that changed Destiny forever. Okay, so we're here now. The place where the Court of Oryx was to take place, and the place which would become Slam Dunk Town, or its actual name, the Hall of Souls. The place where teams would need to coordinate in order to get the raid going. Once again, like Crota's End, this was a familiar area, but one without matchmaking for random players to help you out. Something unique only to the Vault of Glass. I do appreciate that they made a familiar area to the entrance to the raid still though. One thing you would have to do here is split your teams into 2-2-2, two, two, and two, where 4 players total will go on the left and right sides to grab a relic or shoot doors open for the relic holder. Just watch out for the taken phalanxes. One thing to note here and an important one is that nothing was a taken enemy at first, but once you grabbed the relic it was showtime. Also, the enemies were light level 42 while you remain level 40, making the difficulty spike noticeable even on day one. So, once the two relic holders, accompanied by their ad clear and door opener, made it back to the middle, the mechanic was to have them dunk the charges. But at the same time, pretty simple, but something that could be forgotten about if you weren't paying attention. Once the teams were finally done, it was time to jump into the portal from the Court of Oryx and into the actual raid. Uh, three of coins are working here. Uh, you can push through the door. 
Probably for bosses, but... Are you gonna go through the door? Uh, yeah. yep, go there's through. Brand new area. It's very spooky. Alright, there's no way to go Ooh, back. Oh, gravity. Oh, there's no, a chest, there's though. Chest. There's a chest. I got smoldering shard. Yeah, Same. A moldering shard. I'm moldering guessing that's for trading. Uh, uh, extra rewards will be granted from defeating Oryx in King's Fall with at least 20, 20 of these. Ah! Ooh. Normally, I don't include jumping puzzles as encounters, but seeing as how long and how stressful this encounter was, I kind of feel it's necessary. So after jumping across these cool looking lamps and making your way across, the ships were to be jumped on. Hey, I killed the adept and the ship started oh, moving. Oh, yeah, we should have gotten on the ship. Okay, um, so apparently to trigger the movement, we have to kill the adept. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, okay. This was as simple as jump on one to the next but three obstacles were in your way. The first was that Destiny 1 had no mantle, so if you came close, you still could not grab the ledge of a ship. The second one was the puzzle of which ship to jump on and where to jump, especially that big jump late into it. The third was your character loadout. You better have max agility on or this is going to take a really long time. For these teams, however, this was going to take around 20 to 30 minutes on average to clear, but for most players on day one, this was going to take longer. The sheer size and scale of what this raid was going to offer was already on full display, as this room was gigantic, and yeah, it, it now has some really speedy tech to it. Now just collect your secret chest and your calcified fragments for the touch of malice and you're off to the races. Was, this is the exact the, opposite of the Star Wars. We are now in the raid. Alright, this is <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Oh my god. god. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. 33 minutes to get right. into the raid. Alright, power the glyph. Alright. This encounter. Totems. Uh, I don't know how to feel about this one. Stand on a plate and shoot, I guess? Nah, I'll go into detail about it some more. So two players go to the left and two players go to the right while two stay in the middle to clear ads. One player will have a buff on each side called the Brand of the Unraveler, which will give you a timer and you must stand under and defend the totems on each side. Once that 30 seconds is over, the buff is then handed to another player inside of your aura, and the person who previously had the timer will now have the buff, Death Singer's power. This means that they must swap spots with the person in the middle to do the absolutely brain-busting mechanics standing on a plate! Now, do this around 10 times total. The difficulty of this encounter came from some sword knights, a boomer knight up top every buff swap, and your patience in the room. Because if you left too early, your whole team was screwed. To my knowledge, Team Rare Drop was in the lead here and beat this encounter in a very short 11 minutes, securing them a nice head start into the next encounter and first boss fight, the War Priest. Just want to let you know. Fight. War Priest deems you worthy. Worthy. All right. All right. Go to center. 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 Yes, yeah, the, check the buff's gone. That's the check. Uh, check Moldering Shard? Oh, what's, oh. oh, what's that? Oh, T Rex, what? Yo, what's up, 302 Fusion Rifle? Right? Oh. Yo, go shell! Mother yes! Fuck you. Yeah. Man, you guys are. <laughs> Forty-eight minutes into the King's Fall raid, and Team Rare Drop is on the War Priest, a boss that is nothing short of a mix between a knight and a shark, with a sort of general ranking represented with the cloth he's wearing as well as the armor he has on. The War Priest had some nuance to him and introduced a few mechanics to Destiny. Number one, plates. 
Number two, Adept Acolytes. Killing these Adepts before killing a regular Acolyte would cause the rest of them to turn into mini ogres, and trust me, you did not want to do that. The fight simply started by standing on all the plates and dividing your team into two, two, and two again. Once you were done killing all adds, ending in a sword knight on each side, the War Priest would introduce our next new mechanic, the Glyph Sequence. War Priest would light each glyph in a certain order, and you would to follow that order with the final glyph giving the player who stood on it the Brand of the Initiate. This aura allowed everyone inside to hurt the War Priest, but if you stood outside, the boss was immune. The key to this aura was refreshing it by killing adds. So let the timer get low and kill an ad in the pit. Failure to do this will end with your DPS phase ending early and kill the person with the Brand. Assuming all this goes well, or uh, uh, do doesn't doesn't go well, the War Priest will unleash the power of the Taken Orb in the room and kill anyone not behind the shadow of one of the glyphs. After this is done, the glyph will burn off completely, not letting you use that cover again. Once the War Priest was below a third of health, he spawned Taken enemies. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. I absolutely love this as it allowed bosses to have seemingly multiple phases of damage with new mechanics in place and to my knowledge this is something only done in King's Fall, except it's not, it's also done in our next raid. Teams were stuck in him for a much longer time due to either being under leveled or failure to understand mechanics. This is another thing that the former two-time World's First team Invigorate told me was a problem going into day one where everyone expected shotguns to be really powerful, but snipers were actually the key. And because of the buff with shotguns, they all brought in overleveled shotguns without really thinking about snipers. So they did not prep accordingly. A fatal mistake which would cost most teams day one, since the War Priest was honestly a very long range encounter, as well as most of the encounters in the raid. One thing I want to make very, very clear about this raid is that the stakes were higher than any Destiny raid to this point, as the most amount of players were playing during the Taken King, and this year, players knew what raids could offer, what they could bestow to the player base. I also want to say that it's hard to find footage, and that's because there's strategy to that too. Having streams up of other teams, getting insider information, not revealing your strategy, this is all in the name of being first and isn't a bad approach at all. I mean, Datto in Last Wish muted his stream during Vault so they could figure it out and even during the newest Division 2 raid, the world's first team played muted the whole time. Proving a viable option is always there for teams that want to take it. Not to stray too far away though, it was time to say a prayer to this priest for Team Rare Drop in just a short 50 minutes. Boeing. He is gonna be dead. He's dead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's down. Edgar. Get nerd. Oh hey, I got Ingram for that. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, ooh, a legend. Uh, I got two. Ooh, I got a. What is this? I got a couple moldering shards. I got a heavy. Nice, nice, dude. Through the portal. Like Welcome to the beginning of the real difficulty curve of the raid. Once past this maze for some extra loot and a calcified fragment, it was time for one of my favorite bosses of all time, Golgoroth. Well, well right in the boss. God, God confirmed doesn't ever want to do science. He's the commando. <laughs> Alright, this boss has a giant- RUN AWAY! Away! <laughs> Are these thralls are 42 and they're orange. They're pissed off. Watch out for the thralls. And uh, you can shoot him in the- you can shoot him- Golgoroth. Coming out of the water like a dang spider and with spider legs attached to its back would take Team Rare Drop over an hour and 15 minutes with most teams in the race still stuck at War Priest and struggling to get the glyph mechanics down. So let's quickly go over how this boss worked. Golgoroth possessed two weak spots, one on his chest and one on his back. Above him are six smelly balls of darkness each if which shot down will produce a small pool of goop on the floor of his arena which greatly increases the damage done to him. 
Golgoroth will kill any guardian jumping down to take advantage of that unless his gaze is taken by another player. Capturing his gaze is as simple or as hard as shooting him in the back, which will cause him to turn his attention to the player shooting him and will swap from a beam of death into poisonous orbs similar to those of a taken centurion. The player who has drawn Golgoroth's attention must not seek cover or break line of sight at this point, but instead stand their ground and shoot down the projectiles, thus holding, hold, hold, holding his gaze. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. A red death for help was usually the best option here, since, you know, you kill one orb and you get full health back. Golgoroth's attention will be focused on that player for a short time, indicated by a timer called Golgoroth's Gaze. During that time, the remaining players are free to shoot down a bubble, enter the pit, and shoot Golgoroth's chest without any attention or boss stomps from him. Once the Gaze timer runs down, a second player on the opposite side of the area should capture his Gaze to maintain the safety of an arena of attackers. This will cause Golgoroth to turn around, so another bubble must be shot down and the attackers relocate to the new pool to continue attacking. This handoff may be done six times, after which there are no more bubbles and the attackers must leave the area. Or, just, just, just ignore the rest of the balls and wreck Golgoroth with some damage, failing to capture the gaze, but succeeding in damaging him. When Golgoroth has 35-40% to 40 health left, Taken will spawn instead of Hive, making Golgoroth harder to kill. This is something you don't want to happen as Taken will flood the bottom during damage and make it hard to deal with everything else. But a tether and a Stormcaller to clear adds made this very, very doable. One thing I loved in this fight, just like the Warpriest, is that these bosses aren't pushovers. They felt alive and would kill you almost instantly if you stepped into their line of sight, making the victory over them feel that much better. But now, Golgoroth was to suffer the same fate as the Warpriest. Oh, this is bad. I don't have primary. This is bad. Okay. Uh, eight, seven, six, five, four. Take him. Back left, back left. I'm still killing the Taken. My tether. Give me a countdown, Reb. Nine, eight, seven, six. Got him! Yeah! Get so fucking destroyed! I got gloves! Oh, I got gloves too! How oh many my bit runes is this thing gonna give me? Welcome to, uh, the fun walls. Y yeah, yeah, let's go with that. This is the best place to mess with your friends, grab some calcified fragments for your touch of malice, and make your way to the rest of the raid. There's a few ways to do this area, though. Oh, Whoa! no, what? Whoa. Oh, oh my god, there's guys. pushers! <laughs> Now you could do it the simple way, stand on plates, raise the area, jump across, stand and wait. But if you do it that way, you probably aren't gamer. And I am gamer. So let me show you how it's done, you bozo. You just jump over here. <laughs> okay, no, 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 sorry. You just think, jump you can't go down on that needle. You just jump over there! What's good? <laughs> what did he do? I just shit my pants. <laughs> What did you do? There's no way that actually just worked. <laughs> I told you, dude. Sword wall skating is really your best friend to get across here and get your chest, though. But wait! There's more! Hang on to your seat, baby! Cause this one's a screamer! How about a whole secret basketball court of Oryx in which the community went crazy finding and trying to find more with Slayerage spending hours in this room alone? The code to get in was to get near these six lights in a certain order, and then platforms would spawn for you to get in there. Once in, just kick back and dunk on your friends. Now that you're done jamming in there, the raid could resume and the teams racing were about to meet their next big challenge, the Twin Sisters. I don't know what this is. Right this is this democracy is bad. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
Oh. I'm, I'm oh. just going to suicide around one and see what he'll get over here. Just, right. just do a this. Leroy Jenkins. Oh. <laughs> this is the final room, and this room contains the two Death Singers. Sisters of Crota and the Daughters of Oryx, protected by force fields on elevated platforms. Elsewhere in the room are four power plates on pedestals, which may be activated by players to cause semi-transparent platforms to appear in the air. Team Rare Drop, still ahead of every other team, was going to have to get this one done extremely fast to stay ahead, as Golgoroth was a little less stressful on teams who didn't bring snipers leveled up. Back to this room though, hovering high above one of the platforms is a spark of light. Stepping onto any of these platforms will cause enemies to spawn and one of the Death Singers to begin casting a spell, which will wipe the entire team after one minute. One player at random will be torn between dimensions, distorting their vision and making them appear translucent to the other players. This player is the only one who can jump the floating platform summoned by the powered plates. In order to create a path to the spark, the platforms must be activated in a counterclockwise sequence, starting from the one immediately after the spark and proceeding around the room to the one immediately preceding it. The torn player must reach the spark, leap onto the platform containing the Death Singer, which is not casting the spell, and use the spark by holding square or X, to steal the Death Singer's protective aura. This will leave the Death Singer unprotected, allowing the team to damage it and will protect any guardian standing near the stealer from the wipe spell. After the wipe spell is cast, the aura will return to its rightful owner. The cycle will then repeat with the other Death Singer casting the spell in a spark in a different location. So, assuming you killed the first sister and then stayed inside the aura to shield your eyes from the bright white light, the other Death Singer must be killed on a consecutive cycle. So basically, do a one phase of damage to each of these sisters. The same rules really apply to this fight as before, but this was not easy with enemies being level 42 still and slapping you, as well as sniper vandals taking shots at you from afar. After that was done, Enjoy your materials and get ready for the reveal. And then shoot him. It's going down. For real? For real. Oh, she is yeah. so... Now nice. get some! Oh, it's your balls! Ooh. <laughs> but it's not over! Yeah, it's a chest. There's a chest over here. Oh, awesome. God. I got shards, yay! And I got this special weapon. I got a mother shotgun. Nice. Okay, no, 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 Meet Oryx, the Taken King, the finale to this raid and one of the most memorable final raid moments inside of a video game. You could say this was a fight of pure mechanics, and I would agree. You could say this boss only had one set path to kill and you couldn't min-max it, something I'm usually against and I would agree. But one thing I think we can all agree on was that Oryx was a finale deserving of your knowledge of the mechanics and deserving of your time on those mechanics. We'll get into the critiques later on Oryx, but let's quickly go over those mechanics. So... <gasps> Oryx appears when a player approaches the spark. After the player kills the enemy that spawned near the front of the arena, Oryx will move to the near one of the platforms to punch it. This will create a mode of light on that platform, and the four special enemies called Light Eater Ogres will emerge from the ground, one near each platform. One player must claim the spark, being torn between dimensions, as in the Death Singer encounter. Their role is to navigate the summon platforms and reach the spark hanging overhead. At the same time, four other players must summon the platforms that torn between player needs. Just as before, the platforms must be triggered in a counterclockwise sequence starting from the platform on which the mode appeared. However, the four activators must also kill the ogre near the platforms and make sure to do so well away from the path that runs down the center of the area. This is because each ogre will drop a sphere of corrupted light when killed and players must avoid going near it until the proper time. 
The remaining player may float, killing any remaining enemies assisting activators with their ogre kills. When the torn player reaches the overhead spark and claims it, a tomb ship will fly through the arena and deliver a special knight named the Vessel of Oryx. Watch out for the ship. The torn player must jump down to intercept it and then hold square X depending on the console to discharge the spark and steal the knight's aura. A good strategy here was to have a weapons and blessing of light bubble in the middle to clear ogres for your teammates. Once the knight's aura was stolen and the ship coming through was avoided, stealing the knight's aura made the knight vulnerable to all players, and also offers protection from damage to all players standing near the player who stole the aura. At this point, every player must converge on the vessel of Oryx and kill it as quickly as possible. It is recommended this be done near the center of the arena to avoid the corrupted light spheres. Once the vessel of Oryx is killed, Oryx prepares his ultimate attack by opening his chest, emitting a shining white light. Every player must unload as much firepower as possible into Oryx's chest. With sufficient damage, Oryx will stagger. With insufficient damage, the fire team will wipe. Now the corrupted light spheres dropped by the ogres may be used. Four players must each run to one sphere and stand near it for about five seconds until a message acknowledging this appears, and then run back into the aura carried by the torn players to protect them from the corrupted light detonation. You could also wait and do this with a total of eight orbs or even 16 orbs at once, and if you blew up these in fours, the detonation will do a significant amount of damage to Oryx, and any remaining normal enemies will be killed and Oryx will shudder and fall off the side of the area. Oryx will arise at the end of the arena and begin firing on every player at once, as indicated by white circles that appear at their position and then explode. This may be countered by sprinting around the area. After a short time, the barrage will cease. When Oryx is below 50% health, he will no longer do the barrage attack after the corrupted light orbs are detonated, but will instead create a bubble of darkness at one end of the arena, and one by one every member of the fire team will be teleported into it. Within the bubble is a small arena with a foggy perimeter and a shade of Oryx like in the final mission of the Taken King story. Guardian's health does not recharge while inside the bubble, and Guardian's not yet teleported into the bubble may assist those that are by killing the other enemies outside the arena. Those enemies will try to enter the fight with the bubble and interfere with the fight itself, usually just thralls. If the Echo is defeated within one minute, the arena will dissolve and return players to the main encounter. Just pop a three of coins before you kill it. Whew! Okay. So, after Oryx reaches 1% health, he will do what is considered the first ever final stand in Destiny history, and he will rise up for the kill. Teams had caught up at this point, and the stakes were extremely high with the knowledge that Oryx would be the final boss of the raid. Other teams racing didn't have as much time as Rare Drop, though, and the team of Professor Broman, King Gathalion, T-Rex, Falling Cow, or known as Gunny, Cheriona or Char, and Rebelize had dethroned the king once and for all. No. No. Alright, go, 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 right, go. detonate, detonate. I hear we have to hit him again after he's done, so just be wary, be ready. Yeah, I have no, literally I no, I have one sniper shot. Uh, I will probably die for this one. Get in, get in, get in, get in, get in. Get in. Hey, no, everyone's fine. Everyone's fine, he's so low. Not, he's, he's not, not dead, dead yet. He's not dead, he's not dead. Keep, 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 keep burning, keep burning. He's not dead. He's not keep, keep watching, back, keep go. watching, keep watching, keep watching. He's not dead, dead. Yeah, he's coming front, back. front, it comes. Front, uh, no damage. Chest, 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 chest. chest. Yes! Yes! Suck my Oryx! Holy s! Wow! Oh my god! Uh, no damage. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut Uh, no damage. Chest, 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 chest. Yes! Yes! Mother! You bitches! World mother! Sorry, swear first! Ah! Oh, Oryx fell in 2 hours and 23 minutes with a final raid time of 6 hours, 38 minutes, and 52 seconds. 
they were no doubt the victors of this raid with many teams still stuck at Oryx for hours. My personal experience with Oryx was that it was hard as hell. Enemies hit like bricks, tricky mechanics for Destiny at the time, and unforgiving deaths made the hero moments in the raid non-existent for the first time ever, thus changing it even more. One death didn't only cost a little bit, but was devastating on this encounter as the plates needed to be held, ogres needed to be killed, and Oryx damage slash blights needed to be stood in. Overall, this raid was a masterpiece, and hopefully for the reasons I've said so far in this video, this would have you believing the same. This would have you believing that this one really did change the way that Destiny was played. This would have you believing that this really did change raids. Hell, this changed Destiny forever, and was one worth calling a fan favorite forever even if it wasn't my personal favorite. What I described only took into account the day one and normal raid though. But what about the other aspects of this raid that we haven't covered? Well, let's, uh, let's talk about it. What do you want me to say about the loot? That it's the best part of the raid? Well, no. No, the loot was in almost every aspect a downgrade from the previous two raids with an emphasis on this new year of Destiny focused on a balanced sandbox with the raid having options, but not the only option like in previous years. You gotta remember though, this is coming off of a only one meta year with Fatebringer from Vault of Glass, Black Hammer from Crota, and Galahorn from RNG and Zerg, as the only three weapons getting used. So Bungie seriously hit the brakes on the weapons here. For better or worse is for you to decide. One thing I respect about all of these weapons though, is that they all came with the intrinsic perk Cocoon, or auto-loading holster as players know it today. This meant that stowing weapons away made them auto-reload after a short amount of time, and Will of Light made these weapons do more damage to taken enemies. There was the Smite of Moraine as a standout pulse rifle since it had Firefly to pop some heads and life support to heal you when you were low. Also, it was very stable and with the unique scope that all the weapons had, this one was definitely a standout. The other standouts were the Sniper Rifle, Defiance of Yasmin, for its PvP close range scope, and the Machine Gun, Quillum's Terminus, for its large magazine, slow rate of fire, high impact, and of course, Cocoon Perk, allowing you to not deal with the long reload times that a machine gun would have. The rest of the weapons were all just okay at best, but had better options outside of the raid. I want to point out that the gear looked absolutely tremendous, however, with full intrinsic perks to the raid and some outside of the raid too, making this to me feel like a great all-around armor set. The helmet came with the perk Take That, which meant that orb pickups created the chance for temporary bonus precision damage to Taken. The gauntlets came with the Buddy System perk, which meant that there were faster weapon reload times while you were standing in an aura. The chest came with Old God's Boon, which increased armor while carrying the King's Fall Relic. The legs came with Run For Your Life, which increased agility while torn between dimensions, and the class item was... Cosmetic. Yeah, Destiny 1 was not really friendly to class items. All these pieces were great for the raid, with some lasting outside of the raid like the helmet. But one thing I want to stress is that this raid came with a currency called Moldering Shards, which if you've been watching, you've been seeing these guys get dropped a lot. Two of these could, and more than likely would, drop from encounters or chests in the raid, and around 20 of them turned in would net you an extra reward from blasting Oryx into space. Trust me, you were going to need to get familiar with these. Another thing to note here was that there was no adept legendary primaries, gone still to this day but hopefully to make a return in the near future. Finally, there was a ship for something we will get to later, and that pesky ghost shell that nobody could get to drop from the totems except for Goth. Seriously, this thing was annoying as hell to get. The loot in this raid as a whole though was definitely a downgrade from before, and I want to say this was another way this raid was a big change from everything else. 
This time, maybe for the worst though. I also want to point out that this loot struggle was really difficult for leveling as well, with the ghost shell being one of the two things holding most players back from max light in year two. And the reason we ran King's Fall every single week. This is something I will touch face on later into the video, but yeah, aside from a few cosmetics, some more calcified fragments, and oh yeah, the Touch of Malice quest steps to this point, that was the loot. One thing I particularly find fun with Oryx was that you couldn't kill him the first time around with the best weapon to kill him, the Touch of Malice, and instead had to rely on what you had. Especially for the day one raid teams who didn't have any of the exotics we already made videos on. Anyways, that is your King's Fall loot. But now we should talk about how this raid went the extra mile with its challenge and how the hard mode version was seen to be. Hard mode came with some very interesting changes that definitely pushed the hard mode formula further than just a few more enemies and one to two added mechanics to the whole raid. It felt like this raid was meant to be a hard mode raid the whole time, but then was stripped down for a normal mode raid. And that's because, well, it was. That's how Bungie used to make raids, and that's why they would stop making hard mode raids altogether. Bungie, please bring them back! Let's start with the War Priest, though, who came with the changes that every time a totem went down, this boss gained a new attack with the left pillar giving him Centurion Orbs, the center giving him Taken Hobgoblin Orbs, and the right side giving him Taken Captain Attacks. This meant you wanted to get as much damage as possible because getting all three phases of attacks would be really tough to deal with. I cannot stress how much I love this. It makes these bosses feel alive. Multiple phases is exactly why we play anyways, and this was executed perfectly for this boss. Golgoroth also had a change too, but this one was kind of just more funny than anything, with one player in the pit becoming a cursed thrall during damage, and they must stand away from the rest of the team or they will kill them all in the pit. Simple, but still just kind of, kind of, kind of funny. Daughters had no real noticeable changes, but Oryx definitely did with Light Eaters spawning now after killing the ogres on each plate. <laughs> making them another bit of challenge and management to be had. Adds were also much harder, there was more of them, there was no reviving outside of self-res, and it really just meant a complete wipe, at least for Oryx, if nobody was able to stay alive, since this was a long, long fight. Heroic came out at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard on October 23rd, and the recommended light was the previous cap of 300 at the time, with Oryx's encounter being light 320. Team Forever Live ends up winning the world's first hard mode raid in just 90 minutes, since, well, it's kind of more like a speedrun, with learning some new mechanics here and there on the fly. This would also be the raid that Redeem would come in second place for and begin their journey to world's first as well. Hard mode was not the only thing added here, as in the following weeks, challenge mode was released with a calcified fragment and some extra loot, as well as an emblem for completing each challenge to be your reward. War Priest challenge was as simple as a new person had to hold the aura each time, but if you went for the one phase, that wasn't really ever a problem. Oh, somebody almost just pushed me off the stage, bro. My bad. Losing hit points. I had points on two. He's dead. Hey! Let's go! We boss That's up, boys. Evan, I'm proud of you! Let's go! Let's go, baby! <laughs> Golgoroth had every single player needing to hold the gaze, which sounds really cool, but actually ended up being the exact same thing with everybody in the pit, just the player leaving early to take the gaze and then running circles. Oryx challenge really became the way to do Oryx as 16 blights had to be detonated at once and for me and many other players, this actually just became a better strat. Like, thanks Bungie for making it easier, I guess. I guess we'll just pop three of coins and kill the shade of Oryx each time. That's that's pretty easy. Oryx did drop the ship, Agonar Carve, for beating the challenge and it was a very clean looking ship and would sort of see a return in the Whisper of the War mission in Destiny 2. A fantastic final reward for what would be a journey of a raid, and yeah, it would come back with Rise of Iron's Age of Triumph with some beastly looking armor, 
but the same challenges as before, just with adept exotic variants and new level caps. Honestly, Age of Triumph was a great way to wrap this and all the other raids in a nice bow to end off Destiny 1. So, now that we've gassed this raid up and been as objective as possible, let's talk about my criticisms with this raid and why it is both a great raid that changed the game for the better, while also being a downgrade which changed some aspects for the worst. I want to now stress something about this raid that many may have felt back then and why I can't come to call this raid my favorite. It wasn't that it was the only raid for a long time, a whole year in fact, the only year Bungie had done this to this point in the game. King's Fall suffered from the loot problem and it being the only way to reach max level with the ghosts and the artifact drops being exclusive to this raid. Those items weren't even in trials. When I say that it took me months on months on months to reach max level because a freaking ghost shell wouldn't drop at totems, I mean it. Look, I wouldn't normally have a problem with this, but the encounter that the ghost shell specifically dropped from was totems. Vault of Glass had the Forever 29 problem, but at least I could earn my loot all over the raid. This one came from the worst encounter in the raid, something that Crown of Sorrows players would even find boring. DUDE! STOP JUMPING! Another issue I have with this raid is the focus on mechanics and not allowing for any hero moments at all. Look, I'm not fully hating on the way this was handled, but it does take away from the fun and was definitely a huge response to challenge players, making Crota look like a baby who lost its pacifier and Atheon being the stinkiest of cheese ever. Of course challenge players still found a way, but man. These mechanics in this raid are just so hard pressed sometimes, and no encounter is worse on this than the final encounter, Oryx. When I say that this boss is so mechanically stale after the first few times, just believe me. It's boring when every single player, no matter their skill level, has to do the boss the exact same way, the exact same time, and it doesn't add that skill curve that video games should always desire to have. We went from a boss that could be pushed off the map, to a boss that only one player could damage, now to a boss we all have to read a book to put to sleep. Oryx may look cool, and the spectacle can be awesome, but man this is so boring after a while. This doesn't even include the plate mechanics that this whole raid is infamous for. Totems, plates. Warpriest, plates. Sisters, plates. Oryx, plates. Hell, even the jumping puzzles have plates involved. I'm convinced Bungie owns a plate warehouse and is selling us these mechanics to market some fine china. Finally, the torn between dimensions mechanic is cool. For one player. Everyone else just gets to chill and do nothing. Really fun time for this player. Everyone else just sit and sleep. Look, it's starting to sound like I hate this raid and I don't at all. It's just that this was the only raid for a year, and when you play an activity that's supposed to be replayed every week, these cracks in the design start to show. These also wouldn't be a big issue if this raid wasn't flaunted as the biggest masterpiece Destiny has ever seen, when I can think of two raids in my mind that stand well above it. But I gotta respect how much this raid changed Destiny, and brought so many people to the game, while also satisfying those that hated the game the year before. It's cool to think that Joe Staten's vision that ended up dying has evolved into this full story where we now slayed the King of the Taken, get to shoot him from a gun made from him, and get a climactic moment for everyone who's a fan. Just not the same charm multiple times through. We even have theories that Oryx will make a return in the Witch Queen DLC coming next fall, and with the Destiny Vault bringing back the Vault of Glass for Beyond Light, I can only assume that this one will come back with the Witch Queen. I may not love this raid the same way some of you do, but I can fully respect what it did for the game, how it brought so many players to the game, and how it changed the game in so many different ways. The next raid up, and the final raid for Destiny 1, is one that would tie everything I just critiqued about King's Fall, and fix all the problems while also bringing new things to the table. So next time we will talk about it, but until then, Thank you so much for watching this video, like and subscribe if you enjoyed, come watch a stream at EvanF1997, check out the nostalgic merch since it has all the raid bosses from Destiny 1 on it, 
and a special thanks to all of you for watching this video. Seriously guys, thank you so much and I will see you next time. Have a nice day. Somebody confirm for me that we are indeed in Golgorath, Stella. Yes, Lord Daddy. <laughs> oh god! It's even worse than I thought! Oh no, you have to call me that! Oh lord! Yo, we made Mickey! We made Mickey! <laughs> we made Mickey! Get Bubble Boy out here, come on. How did I die? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, 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 o